we will continue with a uh, course on optical engineering. In the uh, last class, we looked at how we can start designing systems and we took a uh, material with a certain refractive index and said what should its shape be such that we get a perfectly focused point image given a point object. So we said in order to do that, in order to achieve that, we need in this image, we need every ray of light that is leaving this source S over here to get imaged at this point P over here. Right? And the equation that satisfies or should be satisfied in order for that to happen is what we have written over here. This is nothing but the optical path length for every ray traveling through the system. So, we have written it for two rays over here. One is the on axis ray. So, that is the ray traveling the distances S naught in medium N1 and S i in medium N2. And another ray from the same point that is this point, it will travel through some point on the interface and then it too should come to the same point P over here. However, it has traveled a distance L naught in medium N1 and a distance L i in medium N2. In other words, we are saying this should be a constant. And we went on further to say that there is such an interface, there is such a shape that will satisfy this equation. That shape is the Cartesian oval. Okay. Now, I can see a number of you wear glasses. I am wearing reading glasses. Do you think the curvature of those glasses, are they Cartesian ovals? No. So, somebody is saying no. That is right. They are not Cartesian ovals. Do you know what shape most lenses have? Convex concave is the nature of. So, convex I will say this is convex, this is concave. But if I had to describe this shape, is it a Cartesian oval? Is it cylindrical? Is it spherical? Does it have some other shape? So, most lenses, uh, it is not correct to say all lenses, but most lenses will be spherical. Okay. So, we have just said the best shape, the shape that ensures any ray of light coming from a point, object point will get image to the same image point is a Cartesian oval. And now I tell you nearly every lens that we use does not have a Cartesian oval shape, but has a spherical shape. Why do you think that is? Sorry? Absolutely. It is easier to build. It is easier to manufacture spherical than it is any other shape. Today, we have very advanced technology where you can input a complicated shape and 3D print almost any shape. But the costs in mass production, 3D printing is not very good for mass production. So, the costs even today to mass produce something other than spherical would be very high. And of course, lenses and mirrors have been used in optical systems for centuries now. And we are talking about manufacturing requirements of the ability to manufacture these shapes hundreds of years ago. Spherical has always been relatively easy to manufacture. So, that might have been the reason historically people started with spherical shape. But even today it is for mass production, spherical shape would give you a cheaper, it is cheaper to mass produce and therefore spherical shape is used. Now, you have to think about this because we are saying the shape that gives me the best optical performance is something and because it is not easy to manufacture that, I am doing something else. Clearly, the optical performance we get from this other shape has to be adequate or better than adequate. We are not sacrificing quality for ease of fabrication. So, we are going to look at under what conditions does the spherical shape satisfy 
this equation over here. Okay. Again, I am not yet starting with the lens, I am just taking a single interface. Okay. So, let us say I am right now going to start off by looking at refraction through a single surface. Okay. So, that is my single surface, that is the optical axis. The difference is I am now specifying that this curvature is of a sphere. Okay. So, if I were to continue this, I would actually draw a circle over here, right. Okay. This is medium n 1, this is medium n 2. The object I want to image is a point on the axis, let us say it is at point s and of course, there will be a ray that travels along the axis. There may be millions of rays, I am going to look at two rays, the one that travels along the axis and the one that travels at some other angle. We will call this distance L naught and this distance S naught. S naught is from S to the vertex here. Let us say the image is at point P. So, this ray goes to point P sorry and this distance is S i. Because this is a spherical surface, there is a center of curvature C and this line can be considered the normal to the surface because this is nothing but the radius of the surface, right. So, in yesterday's class we said we define angles of incidence as the angle between the incident ray and the normal to the surface. So, this is now the angle of incidence theta i, this is the angle of refraction theta t and we are going to need this, you will see shortly why I define this angle psi. Okay. So, let me see, do I have everything I need here? Yeah, this point, let us call this point on the interface as A. Okay. So, the optical path length is n 1 l naught plus n 2, this is l i, l i. But I can write l naught in terms of this triangle. So, I will have n 1 l naught is r squared plus s naught plus r, this distance is again r, this whole squared minus 2 r s naught plus r cos of psi. Yes, again just using some trigonometry here plus the second part of this equation is n 2 and now I am interested in this triangle. Right. So, that is n 2 r squared plus s i minus r the whole squared plus 2 r s i minus r cos psi to the power we are going to use Fermat's principle. Fermat's principle states that the path that light takes is the shortest path. So, I am going to minimize this path length. Shortest path here, we are deciding how this ray travels and reaches this point. If I were to change how it reached this point, it would basically be moving along this surface. In other words, this angle psi would be changing. So, the variable I am minimizing it with is d psi. Okay. We are using Fermat's principle. Okay. 
I'm minimizing optical path length here. So I keep the product n into l, unlike yesterday's example where we were minimizing the time. Then I remove the refractive index. Okay. So if I carry out this differentiation, I'm going to have n1 by 2 um, minus 2r s not plus r sin it will be minus sin so this is actually a plus in the denominator this entire square bracket is going to now go into the denominator remember that square bracket was nothing but the distance l not right so i'll just put l not into the denominator plus n2 here i will have 2r si minus r sin psi, but I will have a minus sign over here. And again, I have a 2 in the denominator and I have L i in the denominator. Yeah. We are minimizing this according to Fermat's principle. So, we are saying this has to be equal to 0. Okay. So, if I cancel out this, 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 this with respect to this 0, what I am going to be left with is n 1 by l naught s naught plus r is equal to n 2 by l i s i minus and I can rewrite this so that I get n 1 by l naught plus n 2 by l i is equal to 1 over r n 2 s i by l i minus n 1 s naught by l naught. The equation in this form is not you are not going to look at this and say ha ah, that really makes a lot of sense. Right? You have applied Fermat's principle, you have got an equation. This equation is telling you something, but it is not at this moment telling you anything very useful. Why? Because the goal was to say every time a ray leaves the point S, I want an expression that tells me how that ray gets to P. And if I look back at this figure, I can see or before I go back to the figure, if you look at this equation. This equation tells me every time I change the ray I trace. Now, when I change the ray I trace, what is happening? I am changing basically, if I change L naught here, if I change the ray I trace, I am changing L naught, which means L i is changing. But that means that equation, the right hand side is also going to change in order for it to be equal. So, if I trace another ray, if I put another ray, so I have a new L naught right. S naught and S i have not changed because those are the points that S naught is the point I want to image. So, it should not change. But if I look at this equation, if I change L naught and L i, the only way this equation is going to stay constant is if I change S naught and S i. So, it does not seem useful at all to me. And we should not be too surprised because we have said the spherical interface is not the interface that satisfies the equation. So, it should not be surprising, but I started out this derivation by saying under what conditions can we use a spherical interface in order to give us imaging. So, in its present form, it is not carrying out the imaging that we want. Is there some condition we can apply that will make this equation work for us? And it turns out if you go back up to this part of the equation. You see you have a cos psi here. Now, what if I said I can make cos psi or let us take the condition when cos psi is equal to 1. 
when would that be? What constraint am I now putting on the optical system? If I say cos psi is equal to 1, I am now saying let us assume only rays making very small angles. So, strictly speaking if I say cos psi equal to 1, that means I say only on axis rays. But I will be a little generous, I would not say only on axis rays, I will say rays making a very small angle with the axis. Let us look at what happens to this equation if we only look at rays that make a very small angle with the axis. So, does that help us? Now, the moment I say cos psi is equal to 1, what will happen to my definition of L naught? L naught was r squared plus s naught plus r the whole squared minus 2 r s naught plus r to the power half. Now, I have put I have put in ok. So, I should actually do this because I have said cos psi is equal to 1, but the moment I do this I can see let us let us expand this. So, I have an r squared plus s naught squared. So, r squared plus r squared minus 2 r squared this and this cancel and finally, my L naught is approximately equal to S naught and of course, the same will happen for L i as well, it will be approximately equal to S i. If I now apply this condition to this equation, I have, so this is for the condition oh sorry cos psi is almost equal to 1 ok. Then I have n 1 by s naught plus n 2 by s i is equal to 1 over r n 2 minus n In other words, I have all I have removed the L naught and L i and I am saying any ray coming from the point S will reach the point P as long as the rays make a very small angle with the optical axis. Okay? We call such rays paraxial rays. This is also sometimes called first order optics or first order approximation because we have made cos psi approximately equal to 1 and not to the 1 minus the next term, right. You can also do third order, higher order approximations, right. This is why the spherical surface is used. Yes, it is easy to manufacture, but it also gives us good optical images under certain conditions. What is the condition? As long as the rays are paraxial. This is now a very useful equation right? and the right hand side of this is sometimes termed as relating to the focal length. So, n 2 minus n 1 divided by r. So, remember your surface had radius of curvature r and it had the mediums n 1 on one side and n 2 on the other and we are now saying this surface has in fact this 1 over f is the power of the surface right power and units always given in meter inverse. The power of this surface is now determined by the refractive indices on either side of the surface and the curvature of the surface. Right? So, if I want to change the power of the surface, these are the variables I have. I can change refractive index or I can change curvature. Now, in a lot of cases, of course, one medium will probably be air and you do not have an infinite 
basket of optical material so you can say I want a material with this refractive index and I will go and pick any refractive index. You have a limited set of optical materials so you are there are not that many refractive indexes indices you can just pick up. So very often the variable you will be playing with is the radius of curvature. We want to change the power or the focal length of an optical lens or mirror you will do that by playing around with its curvature. Now this is still not that useful, why? Because my a lens it does not consist of air on one side and then glass all the way right. It has one surface, it has a second medium and then that medium ends as another interface and then I go back into air or I go back into some other medium right. So I now use this formula as a base. The image created by this interface will become the object for the next interface. That interface will see a certain radius of curvature and it will have a medium of some other refractive index after it and it will create its image and I can now do this forever. The ob image it creates can become the image for the next surface and so on. Okay. So, let us do that now and arrive at an equation for a lens keeping in mind all the time that we are talking about paraxial optics that assumption is not going to be explicitly mentioned again and again but all of this works on the basis that you are saying cos psi is almost equal to 1. Okay. Okay. So, in order oh yeah and one more point we talked about conjugate points also and here we, we are saying S naught and SI these are the conjugate points of this system. That means in this particular example I said let us assume we want to get an image of the source at S and we arrive at the image at P, I could interchange, I could put the source at P and I will get the image at S, okay. So, these are the conjugate points of this system, okay. So, that was the equation for a thin, uh, for a single refracting surface. Let us get the equation of a thin lens. As usual, I start with an optical axis. It is a lens, there are two interfaces. So, I am going to say this is one interface, remember it is part of a sphere or circle and this is another so the, this this is the lens, this is all that we are going to use. One side has radius of curvature R1, the other has radius of curvature R2, okay. So, I have not drawn this properly, please these circles should be going, the optical axis is going through the center of the circles. This I call C2, the center of curvature of this circle and this is C1, center of curvature of the first interface light we will see. This has rate R2, this has radius of curvature R1 and let us say our object is sitting somewhere over here. So, this is point S. So, the distance of S from the first interface we shall call it S01, it is the first object point, right. The thickness of this lens let us call it D. right and finally let us say that the image is forming at P but before it forms at P there is an image formed by the first interface okay and I am going to put that image over here and I will explain why I am putting that image over here okay. So, light traveling from point S hits the first interface, if the second interface did not exist, in the case that I am setting up now, 
its image point would actually be at this point over here. Okay, and I'll I'll explain to you why I've done that. Okay, so the, if this is the image point, whenever we are dealing with lenses, we always measure distances from the vertex of the lens. Okay, so this is my first image. So I call it SI one. This image acts as the object for the second interface. So, the second interface, this is now object distance 2 and this is image distance 2. P is where the final image is formed. Okay. Remember, we had just arrived at this expression. right for a single interface this was refraction at a single interface now what happens in this expression the left hand side is constant for a single interface you're not changing the refractive indices you're not changing the radius of curvature it's a constant now let's say I go on decreasing the distance s naught. What does that mean? I go on bringing the object I want an image of closer and closer to the interface. Because the left hand side is a constant, what does that mean for s i? If I go on decreasing s naught, it means s i is going to go on continuously increasing. At some point, s naught will equal n 2 minus n 1 by r. In other words, it is equal to this or sorry, S naught is equal to f not this. At some point, I can make S naught equal to f. What does that mean for S i? Where does the image happen if S naught is equal to f? That means S i is at infinity. What happens if S naught decreases further? What happens to SI? How will this equation get satisfied? It means SI is negative or as he said it will be on the same side as the object and that is the reason why in this drawing I have put the first image formed on the same side as the object because if you think about it by doing that what am I saying? I have my object distance and let us say s naught is my object distance. I have the focal length f which is of the combined lens. Okay? I am saying combined lens, I mean both the interfaces. But I have f 1 which would be the focal length if there was only one interface. And why we do this is this condition is almost always going to be satisfied. Two interfaces together have more power than a single interface, right? So, this condition is what you would expect or is not surprising that this condition arises when you compare what is happening at one interface to what happens when you have two interfaces. Okay? So, that is why the first image I have kept it on the same side as the object. Okay? Is that clear that point? Okay. So, now I want to use the same equation that we arrived at for a single interface, but apply it iteratively first for the first interface and then the image that is formed will be the object for the second interface and finally arrive at an equation for the full lens. Okay, so, let us do that. 
So I hope you all have this figure because I'm going to be using the variables from this figure. For the first surface, right, keep th the equation in mind, right. So I'm going to have and uh, let's, let's, let me define this as the refractive index surrounding the lens as n subscript m. So that's, that's true here as well. That is the medium surrounding the lens and the medium of the lens I will call n l. Okay? In the first case, this is equal to n 1 by my earlier definition and n l is n 2 okay, for the first, first interface. Okay. So, I have n m by s naught 1 plus n l by s i 1 is equal to n l minus n m and the first radius of curvature it sees is r 1. That is the equation for the first surface and the equation for the second surface n l by s naught 2 plus n m by s i 2 is equal to n m minus n l by r. Okay. At this point, I have to be very careful because I need to know what signs I am going to attribute or assign to each of these variables. There is a sign convention that we need to take into account. Okay. And the sign convention and let me just go to this other. So, the sign convention I have given it to you and I will uh, share this with you on Moodle. So, do not worry about it too much now. But the first column is the sign convention that we are using with lenses. So, concentrate on this for the moment. What are the signs we associate with different parameters? What are those parameters? So, the parameters of interest are the focal length of the system the object distance, the image distance and the magnification. And you can see that for a convex or a converging lens, we will use the focal length as positive. Okay. For a concave lens, it will be negative. And in fact, we will keep coming back to this because I will add a few riders as we go along. But I think at this point, it is enough to just give you this information. The object distance and this is what you need to note because we need to use this information now. If the object is towards the left of the lens, we say that the distance is positive. So, typically historically optics has always been designed by tracing light traveling from left to right and that is why here if the object is towards the left or is left of the lens we say the distance is positive. If the object lies to the right of the lens, we say its distance is negative. The reverse is true for the image. If the image forms to the right of the lens, it is positive. If the image forms to the left of the lens, it is negative. Okay? That is really what is important for you right now. We will come back to this, but keep this convention in mind. So, I have to be now careful with these distances. I have written out two equations, but this equation, this term S naught 2, it actually is a sum of this term and this term. And I need to take the convention, the sign convention into account when I add up these two terms. Okay? So, S naught 2 is actually going to be S i 1 plus d. And what was the convention for the object? If an object was to the left of the lens, it was positive. So, S naught 2 can remain like this. But S i 2 is an image distance and in this particular case, it also lies to the left of the lens. So, by the sign convention, this is going to be negative. So, I will just write that here maybe. Object distance to the left of the lens is positive. Image distance to the left of the lens
is negative. So, this is what I am going to get following the sign convention. There are other conventions and there is no problem with you using any convention. You just have to ensure that if you are solving or working out a problem, you stick to the same convention from beginning to end and it is also good practice to state what is the convention you are using, especially if it is going to be different from this one, just so that it is clear. Okay? Okay. So, if I now take these two equations and I add them up, keeping in mind the sign convention, let us see what we get. So, let us take all the n m terms 1 over s not 1 plus 1 over s i 2 equal to and on this side I have n l minus n m that is one term plus I have n l 1 over s i 1 minus 1 over minus s i 1 plus d. All I have done is add up these two the equations for each of the interfaces. Now, to make this again a little more useful immediately, let us make an assumption that the lens we are dealing with is a very thin lens. So, for a thin lens, in other words, the thickness d is 0. Why is it valid to make this? Even in the morning class, I talked about geometric optics as being the regime where we consider lambda to be 0. And that is a valid assumption to make because we are talking about imaging objects much bigger in dimension to lambda. So, here again if I say thin lens, how far away is the object from the lens? If we are talking about distances much larger than the thickness of the lens, with respect to the thickness I can consider that distance so much larger, the thickness can be considered negligible. Okay? But the advantage of doing this is, if I look at the equation above now, if d goes to 0, this term here will disappear. So, with that condition, I can now say, and let us make some more assumptions. Let us say the medium surrounding the whole system, medium n m is equal to 1. So, let us say it is air. I will have this equation. I have an equation which is in terms of the object distance, in terms of the final image distance the object distance s not 1 is the location of the object on the optical axis from the vertex of the first surface. The image is the location of the image point on the optical axis from the vertex of the second surface. right? And the medium surrounding this lens is air, so I am not bothered about its refractive index and the medium of the lens is n l that appears in the equation, both the radii of curvature appear in the equation. It is not very different from the equation we got for the interface that also the power was a function of radii of curvature, radius of curvature. Here it is a function of both the radii of curvature. Okay. Again, this is called the power of the system. And often you will see it written in this form, where u is used as object distance and v is used 
as image distance. Okay. This if you write this in terms of u and v, it is also called the lens makers formula. Sometimes this is called the Gaussian lens formula. pretty straightforward. So, let us just run through some possible scenarios here, but what happens now when the object is located at different places? Right? This is again high school optics, right? but now you should have a little better understanding of where it is coming from. Right? If you go back to your equation 1 over object distance plus 1 over image distance is equal to 1 over the focal length. If the object is at infinity, this term is disappearing, the image is happening at the focal length itself, right. And you can move your object from infinity to a position 2 f away from the lens to something in between 2 f to less than f and you can see how the image moves accordingly, okay. And that is one of the first exercises you will do in the lab the simulation lab is to simulate by changing object position where the image is forming and also looking at the nature of the image because mostly you may get a real image, but at some point the image will appear to be on the same side of the object and then you get a virtual image. Okay? So, I will just scroll through these, but this is actually what you need one of the exercises you need to do in the lab today is actually send light through a lens and change object position and then monitor where the image is forming ok. And you can see this is the last case when the object moves to a distance less than focal length the rays now they are still of course going through the lens but they are diverging here, they are not going to converge to a point, they appear to come from a point over here and that is why we say it is a virtual image. It is virtual because we would see it with our eyes as if it was coming here, forming here, when actually the rays are diverging over here. You could not place a camera or a screen here and capture, you could not place a screen here and capture that image, you need extra optics to capture that image. 